Chairman, are we, are we to uh, read it again? Call order. Uh, please rise. We'll start with pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the Master Arms Report. Uh, we have actually several items on the agenda for tonight. So I'll start off with announcements. I'm welcome. First off, in context of meeting submissions, our, our public meeting submission went out on March the 16th. Our uh, sources, the West Virginia Secretary of State website, West Virginia State Journal, newspapers in Weird and Stumbo, Wheeling, and Martinsburg, and meeting notifications to the WAPA email list also on the same date, it's the 16th. And um, just and also, as you're well aware, on our web, uh, WAPA website, we post all the meeting agendas, minutes from previous meetings, resolutions. Uh, YouTube videos of the uh, presentation and also committee meeting results and work process. The event also was uh, posted on Facebook on March the 20th for this meeting. In the month of March, uh, in the context of committees themselves, the safety subcommittee met, met on March the, on the 10th, the finance committee met on the 17th, and for the public, again, these meetings are open for uh, for your attendance and participation over to be witnessing. Okay. First uh, major announcement to this case, the executive director's 2015 first quarter interim report. I was asked to read that summary into the record, and I will do so at this point. Mr. Chairman and members <coughs> of the board, the first quarter of 2015 was filled with milestones. A newly established governance and committee oversight structure took shape. The Weirton Area Port Authority Board was reconstituted and expanded. The Office of the Executive Director established two limited liability corporations for mergers and acquisitions, equity, debt, and bond financing. Those two entities being the Intermodal <coughs> Holding, LLC, often known as IMH, and the Inland Services LLC, known as ISL. These organizations to manage, capture, and finance report operations. The WAPA Future Fund received its first initial income from operations. Intermodal Holdings, LLC, again IMH, acquired controlling interest in MBS Enterprises. ISL prepared for a private placement that uh, should go to effect or for the second quarter here coming up. Political organizational barriers and inefficiencies have separated WAPA and its not-for-profit and for-profit local four district economic engines were removed and a new public-private corporate structure was engineered. Against this backdrop of productive change, local, state, national markets and economic performance continue to improve in collaboration under committee oversight the Office of the Executive Director and Inland Services LLC financed and capitalized a robust six-month pre-restoration phase at the signaling plant MBS warehouse by then achieving the best quarter of metals, especially metals volume performance in the port's history. In addition to handling record metals volumes and emphasis on workforce development, training, safety, security, and environmental sustained growth and fiscal responsibility has produced a positive change in the port's financial performance. Committee alignment and oversight of qualified and vast experience design, build, finance, and operate and maintain finance institutions, including independent forensic, compliance, and accounting firms continue to evolve and develop, including, including shortlist selection of the 2015 Intermodal Rail and Marine Terminal Metal Services Center Section 559, IRS 338H10, and IRS 6320, Transportation and Financial Advisory Team. 
Public support and participation via multiple media outlets showed great promise and growth each month to sustain resilient port operations within the federally designated Metropolitan Statistical Area and state of West Virginia designated local port district. And attached to, was a document that was sent to the board members, the uh, Parsons, the 2012 Parsons Brent Ross statewide final report and different financial structure letters that were received. The second uh, area of, of announcements in context of new is new is the area of uh, an update on the SOC codes, the federal SOC codes which operates at the terminal. Stand again, SOC standing for standard occupational classification codes. And I'll read to the record a quick summary of the first uh, rates that have been that are up for consideration. And again, this is for the uh, for the terminal. A SOC code in this case is a six-digit type of uh, numbering scheme assigned by the federal government for every job category, be it engineering, administrative, management, etc. So, for example. The General Operations Management Code is 11 1021. This allows you to standardize your, your uh, bidding on federal programs. So, I have in this case four uh, rates that have been established. Uh, first, again, General Operations Management, again, Code 11 1021. The income range from 62,000 on low to a high of 167,000 with an annual median of 114.5. Financial analyst, in this case code 13-25, 2051, excuse me, with a rate uh, range of 45,000 to 99,000, in this case an annual median income of 72,000. The health and safety engineer code, in this case 17-2111, Range of uh, salary from sixteen thousand to one hundred nine thousand, with median medium of eighty four five, <clears throat> and also in the industrial engineer category, seventeen dash two one one two, a range again sixty to one hundred nine thousand, with a median of eighty four five. Next order of business, Mr. Chairman, is the, uh, is the area of training sessions. As the Master of Arms, uh, responsibility to prepare um, education for board members for our various affiliated companies and, and the officers and directors and employees, etc., and also for public benefit open to the public. On March the 12th, we held our first uh, M and training session. In this case, the Roberts Rules of Order. Our guest speaker was John Sorrenti, provided courtesy of the West Virginia State Auditor, Glenn B. Gaynor III. We posted the training session on YouTube, so it's available online on our website. And certificates of completion were issued to attendees and uh, for some of the people that are back on the back table. And I have the certificates for the board members that participated in that training. <coughs> uh, <can> I <coughs> sure. So, I wasn't able to be here live. I uh, wish I would have, but I did watch it on YouTube. It is an excellent uh, training session. Very well done, very well taped back there. Uh, but it is very good. It, it gives us the rules of engagement and everything, and <coughs> I encourage everyone to watch it. <coughs> The uh, next training session will be held on April the 21st here at the Weird Hall of the End. 21st is actually a Tuesday. And the uh, topics will be the West Virginia Open Meetings Law and, uh, and Ethics. The training materials provided by the West Virginia Ethics Commission will be used for that session. And in May, we are starting to plan a training session on insider trading.
My next order of business, Mr. Chairman, is on the issue of policy related uh, board resolution submittals. In this case tonight, we are going to be looking at two uh, policies in the area of insider trading and in related party transaction policy. I will be presenting these, uh, reading, reading part of this into the record, and I know you'll be handling this during your new business section of the night. So, can I get to the next slide? Yeah. I summarized an important section in this insider trading, and I'm going to go ahead and read uh, what uh, has been summarized and in the uh, policies up on the website, but in this case, what we refer to as our acknowledgement page. And I want to take the liberty of reading that again into the record for tonight. And in the case you have insider trading, uh, the key issue is that, is that a, this uh, applies to uh, the companies, basically the board of directors, officers, and employees of and all agents, advisors, volunteers, consultants, and contractors to the company, in this case, basically defining the company as the port. Okay, and again, all those affiliates. So first, this is I understand if the person signing up was acknowledgement, I understand it will comply that while I am in the possession of material, non-public information related to the company, neither I nor any related person may trade in the company's securities or engage in any other action to take advantage of or to pass on to others that information, i.e. tipping. This general prohibition also applies to material non-public information related to any other company with publicly traded securities, including our customers or suppliers, obtained in the course of employment or association with the, with the company, basically in space, inside the type of information. And a couple other related definitions here. Again, as I mentioned, the company being, again, Board and on its affiliates. Third, a definition of related persons. I understand that a related person includes my spouse, my children, extended family, anyone living in my host household, partnerships in which I am a general partner, corporations in which I am either singly or together with others, the related persons owning controlling interest, trusts of which I am a trustee, settler, or beneficiary, estates of which I am an executor, ex executor, executor or beneficiary, or any other group, or entity, whereas the insider can share with others the power to decide whether to trade in company securities. But again, the definition of related persons around you. And then again, I understand, you see this, I understand that material public information is material. If one, there is a substantial likelihood that, I, that a reasonable investor would consider it important in making a decision to buy, sell, or hold a security or two, where the fact is likely to have a significant effect on the market price of that security. Examples of material on public information include earnings, dividend actions, mergers and acquisitions, major dispositions, securities offerings, major discoveries or new products, significant research advances, major personnel changes, labor negotiations, major contract negotiations, unusual gains or losses in major operations, major litigation, and major marketing changes. And bottom line, then the last I have here is that I understand if I have questions on any time regarding this policy, I will consult with the Office of the Executive Director. I will also report any, any potential violations. So again, for that policy. <coughs> Second policy, Related party transaction. I understand this policy applies to WAPA, its office of the executive director, its omnibus subsidiaries, affiliates, and associated companies, including partnership terminals. Again, definition of the company. I understand that for the purpose of this policy, a related party transaction is a transaction, agreement, or relationship which a company was, is, or will be a participant and which any related person has, or have, has, or will have a direct or indirect material interest in that agreement. I understand the related person includes, again, talking before any current or recent, actually excluded, extended this, I understand the related person includes any current or recent director of the company, 
a director nominee, my spouse, children, and the others that I described earlier. In the event that I, that I am a related person to a potential transaction, I will disclose these facts to the company and I will accuse myself of participating in any internal company discussion. I understand a related party transaction shall only be consummated or shall continue if A, the chairman, vice chairman, finance committee sponsor, and executive director shall approve or ratify such transaction in accordance with the standards set forth in this policy. <coughs> Two, the transaction is approved by the disinterested members of the finance and operations committee of the board for transactions that exceed $25,000 and see the transactions on terms comparable to those that can be obtained in arm's length dealings with an unrelated third party. I will respect the confidentiality of all company transactions. If the identified transaction is not subject to public disclosure, then I shall treat such information as confidential and not make any transaction details or other related information available to the public <coughs> or others not involved with the transaction. I understand that violation of this policy, including allowing the subordinate to violate this policy, shall be subject to disciplinary action, including possible termination. And that's what that means. <coughs> Next order of business, board nomination. Again, uh, this is for for the record, and I know you'll be considering this in the uh, new business section of the meeting. In this case, the board nomination of uh, Bethany Dentiste Goddard. Serving on the Waffle Board, I'm going to read in her nomination for the record. Serving on the Waffle Board is an exceptional opportunity to help foster continued growth and sustain resilient port operations within our state of West Virginia, designated local board district. While serving as a board member requires both commitment and energy, is a rewarding <coughs> and fulfilling opportunity, and a great way to give something back to the Brooke, Hancock, Jefferson counties, and city of Weirton communities. Bethany Goddard is a resident of Wellsburg in Brooke County, and is being nominated to fill an open seat on the board. Bethany Goddard holds an, an administrative position with Inland Services, LLC, at the Office of the Executive Director. She holds a Master's Degree in Education from West Liberty University and has been a court volunteer since the fall of 2014. She has completed FEMA-level training and currently holds a quick credential. Mrs. Goddard is an active educator as well as a member of the Brook Hills Free Methodist Church. She is an active volunteer for the American Cancer Society and the American Heart Association. Mrs. Goddard considers herself to be a lifelong learner and educator who will, as a board member, encourage the professional growth and cohesion of the Waffle organization and its affiliates. And Mr. Chairman, our last order of business is uh, opening up the meeting to a mayoral candidate for Mr. Harold Miller. I like your uh, selection of jackets, so I will. <laughs> we didn't have a big introduction lead in there for you, Bobo, but uh, I, we invited all four candidates and um, uh, candidate uh, Miller was uh, one who could make it tonight. Uh, we had uh, Nick Fiscardo could not make it. He had another appointment and we didn't hear back from the mayor, uh, Condic, or Karen Harris. But yeah, I just want to give a few, give uh, Bobo a few minutes to talk about his ideas for, and I was going to let all four of them do that. Uh, with that, I know Bob, you can go ahead and uh, say a few words to the group. And well, first, I'd like to negotiate because uh, we're each allowed five minutes. The last time, uh, we were given 15 minutes, two of us were running the last time. The one following you seven minutes, so they gave me the other portion of his time, and I used it. I won't keep you long. Uh, I've always supported the Port Authority. Uh, I worked at Bridge Steel, retired 15 years ago. I uh, retired as general manager of sales and services. Went to work for Allegheny Steel in Pittsburgh for two years as vice president of sales. <coughs> but the interesting thing is I started out as a clerk on the railroad at Weirton Steel. And while they were building the BOP, 
teach P-Shop. I checked all the tracks and all the cars. I knew a lot about the mills before I even got in the sales department. I worked there in the summertime when I was going to school. Got in a reheat furnace one day. The next day I was cutting grass at Mr. Millsop's house. They asked me, do you like it up there? Do you know what I was doing yesterday? <laughs> if you don't know what a reheat furnace, that's when you heat up the slabs to get them hot enough to roll them on a hot melt. And it's probably about, when we got in there, we had to wear special shoes and you could only go in there for 10 minutes at a time and show scrap out of there. Uh, so I was happy to be up there, and they said, well, you did a good job trimming around the tree, so you want to come back every day this summer? And I said, no. <laughs> Are you kidding? So I'm married. I uh, married Christine Lopresti. We live here in Weirton. I've lived here my whole life. We've been married 43 years. We have three kids, six grandchildren. And uh, Weirton's a wonderful place to live. I first got on city council in 2003. The reason I ran was that uh, I had been retired before the mill went bankrupt. It went bankrupt, I lost half of my pension, all my benefits. Most people who worked at Weirton Steel, if they lost their benefits, they didn't even know who to call to get insurance because the mill took care of you like you were one of the children. And uh, when I was a kid, the mill used to plow the streets, they hung the, the Christmas lights, they did everything for the city. The heat for the community center came from the hot mill. So all that took place, but when they filed bankruptcy, they didn't have a tax with Weirton Steel, they had an in lieu of agreement, and it held no standing in the bankruptcy court. So the city couldn't sue the company or the, you know, in, the, in a bankruptcy to get any money. So well, this can't happen to our community again. So I decided to run, and I was elected as a councilman. The first thing I did is went down to see my friend Ricky Omishi of Wheeling Mission and the city manager of Balmsby, and found out what kind of agreement they had. They were very successful and very beneficial city of Balmsby. So we adopted an agreement similar to theirs with the new owners. And uh, from there, though, uh, one of the other things that was interesting is I paid attention to the previous Port Authority that they had in the city. And for years and years, they had meetings, and they hired a guy out of Kentucky, paid him 30000 a year to come up here and tell us what we should do in our area. And But he was a friend of Governor Wise, so I kind of understood how that kind of stuff all comes down. And they didn't really just understand the Port Authority. They thought they had to be on the river. The city only had a small portion of the property on the river. And I told them, I said, I don't think you need to be on the river. You know, you could build a storage facility up here on Free Springs Drive, and we can bring product in on the river and store it here and distribute it. The one advantage that the city of Wharton does have is the Ohio River. It's one of our greatest assets in the city of Wharton. We shipped large. After I retired, I forgot to tell you, I had a small brokerage company called A Lot of Steel Associates. There were a lot of steel associates because I got a lot of old retired guys who would work my commission on. We were shipping barges. My son and I were selling hot balls and shipping barges to Houston, Texas. Have any of you been to the port of Houston? You know how big it is and what goes on down. We were shipping barges on the river, cheapest mode of transportation. I predicted then that we need to put more effort into, into the river traffic and transportation, the commercial end of it, because of the cost of fuel was going up. And it was the cheapest mode of transportation. You bring it into Weirton, unload it, and in an hour you could have it in Pittsburgh. If you leave it on the river, you've got to wait another 24 hours before it gets up there. All kinds of benefits for the Port Authority. So, but this Port Authority was just non-active. First of all, if you bring this guy that's from Kentucky, what's he know? There's got to be somebody in our area that knows something about it. And they just never had a real project. <coughs> so when BJ contacted me, he started getting involved. When he was involved and I said, I'm, I'm interested. I'm in. Count me in. But at the time, I couldn't get involved in being on the board. Uh, I was sick last year. I'm better now. And I'm running for mayor again. And you can believe me, if I get elected, I will be totally supportive of what you're trying to do here. I totally will be. And I know there's a division down on, on uh, Half Moon, on one side of the highway and the other side of the highway. And there's a little battle going on. And we'll get into that, too. But uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer a lot of questions. I've been active in this community since I was a young man. Uh, I joined the uh, Weird JCs in, I think, 1969. Back then, you had to be 21 to join. And in 19, or 1967, I joined in 1969. I was elected to president at 23 years old. I was the youngest president, local president of the state of West Virginia. I've never stopped being involved in the community since then. I started Weird Steel. At the same time that another Bubba started his career, and that was Bubba Smith, the 
Baltimore Colts then, if you remember, we played football at the same time. Not together, not professionally. <laughs> they were <laughs> the same age. I had a nickname Buff, the UV, and when I started Weird, Weird, Weird Steel in 1967, uh, I, one of the fellows I worked for in customer service started calling me Bubba. So over the years, if I answered my phone, Harold Miller, they would hesitate to say, is this Bubba? So everybody knows me by Bubba. And uh, I have a business here in town now. I own the old Polish Hall for 10 years now. And uh, we run out space, and we have all the swings downstairs twice a week. There are none nationally, internationally. I call it the international headquarters. There's only one. It's just an international headquarters. Uh, but uh, like I said, I served on city council. I was general manager of sales, vice president of sales. I was on the Madonna Athletic Board. Uh, I'm trying to remember all these things. I am currently a member of the Comfort House here. We're Comfort House is an advocate for abused children. Uh, I've been on the board three years. I supported it the whole time I was on council with funds. They're partially funded by the state of West Virginia, partially by private funding. Uh, and I try to be more uh, open about what goes on because for years and years, the system we're protected about the, the bad things that happen in our community. Well, physical and sexual abuse in our community has been on the rise every year since I've been associated with Comfort House. So we need the community to get involved and are getting more and more involved in this. And it's a terrible, terrible situation when a two-year-old is penetrated by a 60-year-old man or something. That just aggravates you. Or that physical abuse continues through family generations and generations. So it's something I'm very serious about. And uh, uh, the other thing that I did uh, about two years ago, and Mark's here, you should listen to this, I realized right before uh, the uh, Sandy look took place, I was watching the news in Atlanta, they evacuated a school of 500 kids because of carbon monoxide leak. They went into the hospital. What caught my eye was it put on the screen that only two states in our nation make it mandatory to be in schools, carbon monoxide leak. I couldn't believe it, two states. We weren't one of them. It was only Kentucky and Maryland. Soon after that, I started investigating. It took me six months just to get answers from the state of West Virginia through the Forest Marshal of the Senate there. Well, I began a campaign to get them into the school where my grandkids go. And first of all, heard about my project. She partnered with me, gave me some detectors. And then we had a new school under construction. Went to the superintendent and says, can we override your contract and give them that new school before it's closed? It's not mandatory. You don't have to do it. I think you should do it. She did. She overrode it. We got a new elementary school. We have it in every school in Hancock County. The sad thing is, Senator Fitzsimmons wrote legislation that he was going to present in January for the state of West Virginia to adopt it, and he lost the election. <laughs> so I've got to start with a new senator to get legislation written. So that in future new schools, it will be part of the contract and gradually uh, place them in the older schools as they have the funding to do so. That's one thing I'm most proud of. Uh, I served as chairman of the Renaissance Festival. It was my idea. I was the, the founder of it. And we had it on the 4th of July at Main Street. It was hugely successful. And they discontinued it under the current mayor. It didn't take it very long to discontinue that. Uh, St. Joe's uh, Fall Bazaar. I was a, two-term president of St. Joe's uh, uh, Church Council. And uh, like I say, uh, one of my uh, talks, I talk a lot about safety and security in the community. Uh, we don't know what's going on. I saw today where another police officer was shot. And uh, I am a proponent of supplying the fire safety and rescue squad. All the latest equipment is available to them. I'd rather have it and not eat it need it and not have it. You'll get more criticism for not having it uh, than uh, if you, you didn't have it so, or had it. So uh, if there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. There's a lot of conversation in our community about B&O tax and the condition of the community. The, the, the city looks like hell, and, uh, and the B&O tax is chasing businesses out of town. We don't need that. I'm a proponent of uh, repealing the BNO. We've got an alternative. I have alternative ideas. Um, I hope to get in. I know I've talked too long, but there's
there's a lot of issues going on in the weird right now, and uh, you need to be aware of some of these things. It's like they passed the other, the last uh, meeting they had on the budget. They took the, there's a two dollar service fee in weird. Everybody works in weird. Two dollars goes to a fund specifically set. And I was involved with this legislation. It says for street paving and sailing. They took the money from that and put it in the pension funds. At the same time, they said they were getting increases on the B&O money. I said, why don't you take the B&O money and put it in the pensions? You can't take that money and use it for anything but street paving and safety issues. So they just, it's a shell game. Plus, they never explained what happened to the $1.6 million that they can't find. So that's why they passed the B&O. Exactly. <laughs> So accountability and responsibility is my main theme when I talk to people. Every department head has to be accountable for these programs that we have going on in the city. And I will make them accountable. I, mean, I was accountable when I had the responsibility of general manager of sales and services. And if I didn't get done what we needed to get done, I would get done. And that's the way the city has to operate. I thank you for your time. It's taking more time than. Uh, okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, so I was going to introduce a few people, but we'll, we'll do the introductions first. So we got a room of a variety of people. You all met the candidate for mayor. We've got Mike Barbarito with uh, First National Insurance Agency. Uh, we've got Mark Sateslo, the new uh, District 1 House of Delegates representing uh, Hancock County. Uh, we've got Rod. What the hell is your last name? Young. Young. I don't know why I can never remember that. Rod's with uh, uh, Great Plains Biofuels, and he's been uh, working with us on um, and, and entertaining and learning a lot about the region and supporting some of the biofuel activity plus some of the other financing roles we have. Uh, we have Mr. and Mrs. Lash with MBS Enterprises, uh, other partners for the port. Am I missing anybody? Am I missing anybody key? We got my guys that uh, work down there. Well, now I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, we don't have anyone on the phone. I listened for a while and I was there. Uh, with that, let's do the roll calls now. Uh, Doug Valdo. Here. Dan Spicker. Here. Mark Galiptus is absent. Santos Santoro is absent. Uh, Dan Swan. Here. Charlie Wood. Here. Ed Littlejohn. Here. And John Barbo is not on the phone. So. Uh, okay, so we've got the roll call done. If I can get a uh, motion for the adoption of the agenda as written. Dan Spicker, do I have a second? I'll second. Uh, any comments or questions on the agenda? Uh, with no comments or questions, uh, all, uh, all those in favor of approving the agenda signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed? Okay, now I want to make a comment here. Last meeting we did the Roberts Rules, and, and uh, Mr. Shane talked a lot about Roberts Rules short form for small boards. We're not adopting that at this point only because the board's going to continue to grow and it's important to continue to understand that Robert's Rules full protocol and the committees possibly we could use the short forms on the smaller boards. But uh, I just in case anyone had questions because we went through that last week and I'm not doing this. So I want to make sure I understood. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is approval of last month's meeting minutes. Uh, can I have a motion to bring that to the floor? A motion. Well, I'll have a second. I'll second. Farley. Um, uh, any comments or questions on previous meeting minutes? Okay, with no comments or questions, all in favor of approving the minutes signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, the minutes approved. Um, next slide. Okay, we have some resolutions in committee. Um, the first one. Uh, is board resolution 84, and that you is. Don't, you don't have it, I just I don't have it. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. And uh, that was sent to committee in August, 
and we requested the information the soft codes, and uh, today they were ready to the record for the pipe out of Florida Motor Rail Terminal. Is there any other updates on that from um, And then Board Resolution 78, uh, we also sent to the Finance Committee last month to develop a standard of conduct policy, which uh, there's nothing new to report there, but it will be similar to the previous policies we had in the <coughs> We have some new resolutions. And the first one is Board Resolution 105. I'll read this and then go ahead. Why don't you start with 109? 109. Okay. Board member. 109, there it is. All right, I'll read this. So. A written area port authority board resolution for the purpose of appointing Ms. Bethany Goddard as a board member. Whereas the WAPA bylaws state in Article 4, Section 8, that the board may consider consist of up to seven members, but not less than four serving for five year non overlapping terms. And whereas the WAPA board has been seeking interested individuals with appropriate business and community expertise to expand the breadth of the board's capabilities and to fill open seats. And whereas Ms. Ms. Bethany Goddard, or Mrs. Bethany Goddard, a resident of Brook County, West Virginia, a successful professional with Inland Services LLC working in the Office of Executive Director and an active volunteer with WAPA has expressed an interest in serving on the WAPA's board. And whereas Mrs. Goddard's bio and qualifications attached have been reviewed and found to meet the current requirements defined in WAPA's bylaws with her being an individual with skills and expertise that would be a valuable addition to broaden the depth of the board. Therefore, let it be resolved that the written area of Port Authority board points Bethany Goddard as a member of its board for a five-year term expiring in 2020. Now that's how the resolution reads. It's going to have a motion to bring it to the floor for discussion. Uh, a second? Uh, comments, questions? Uh, I know some of us have worked with Bethany over in the offices and others might not have had any time, but I'll say she's done a great job supporting MJ and and has a good uh, background in education, which we're going to have a lot of training in education, but policy interests and other areas of uh, support. So, uh, anybody else have any comments or questions? Okay, with no comments or questions, all in favor of appointing Miss Bethany Goddard to the board signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, let the record show we have a new board member. Grab the chair over there and sit. Oh, this yeah, we'll stick you right up there. <laughs> Thanks, <You can>. Carl. <laughs> Thank you, Bethany, for helping us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's go, we'll start back at the top, 105. Uh, it's the insider trading policy that we discussed, or the Master Arms uh, discussed earlier. Um, I'll read the resolution and then we'll. Should I be doing the vote before this reading, or the motion before we can talk about it? Or is it okay to read the discussion? Yeah, before discussion. Yeah. All right, a, a, a board resolution, inside the trading policy, board resolution 105. A written area port authority board resolution for the purpose of establishing insider trading and material information policy. Whereas this policy defines guidelines for all individuals, <clears throat> WAPA, its Office of Executive Director, which is OED, and or omnibus subsidiaries, affiliates, and associated companies who are or may be involved with or privy to knowledge of plan or executing financial transactions that are governed by Federal Securities and Exchange Commission regulations or under other related regulations as required. Whereas the WAPA board recognizes an insider trading and material information policy is necessary for the oversight and protection of the Wharton Area Port Authority, the OED, the Omnibus subsidiaries, affiliates, and associated companies, including partnership terms. Therefore, let it be resolved that the board approves the attached insider trading and material information policy, and further resolve that the Office of Executive Director is authorized to take the steps necessary to immediately implement this policy. Can I have a motion to bring this to the floor for a discussion? I motion. No, the second? I second. Dan, uh, 
Any comments or questions related to this resolution? No comments or questions. All in favor of approving the board resolution 105 signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Let the record show the hands. Uh, 106. Related party transaction policy. <clears throat> the Whitney Area Port, Port Authority WAPA board resolution for the purpose of establishing a related party transaction policy. Whereas this policy defines guidelines for all individuals, or WAPA, its Office of Executive Director, and or omnibus subsidiaries, affiliates, and associated companies, whom are or may be involved with the execution of financial transactions that are governed by the Federal Securities and Exchange Commission regulations or, other under, or under other related regulations as required. Whereas a related party transaction is defined to be a transaction, transaction executed between two parties having a personal or business relationship with a related party, uh, which is an individual or group, uh, which is related in some way to the transaction's initial party, uh, family member, relative, stockholder, or related corporation. Whereas the WAPA board recognizes that related party transactions can present actual conflicts of interest and create the appearance that company decisions are based on considerations other than the best long-term interests of the company, its shareholders, and the public. This policy is design, designed to mitigate risks associated with related third-party transactions. Therefore, let it be resolved the board approves the attached related party transaction policy and further resolve that the Office of Executive Director is authorized to take steps necessary to immediately implement this policy. Uh, do I have a motion to move to the floor? So moved. My motion is okay. A second? Second. Dan's final second. Comments, questions? Yeah, I, I do have a question about taking a lot of words here. Why? So the is the essence of, of this one is that one of us would have a have a business that we would want to do with respect to the entire structure of the Port Authority and all the subsidies that if if we were to do something we would just recuse ourselves from voting on anything or really talking to any board members about that? Is, is that the essence of this? I was trying to get a handle on it. Disclosure. Okay. Disclosure. So, so we would disclose or someone on would disclose, like if we have a relative or something wanted to do business, we would have to disclose that, then we would recuse it. No, correct. And disclose the transaction. So any, yeah, an example, if you and I had another deal going on that was dependent on the closing of one of these, Somehow, we need to disclose that, not keep it hidden where nobody knows. Understood. That's a okay. joint related party transaction. Okay, very good. So, like on the broadband side, then down in the southern part of the state, then one of the individuals associated with finance of the broadband ended up, funds went to his nephew. Oh. And it was never disclosed, but through an audit, it was identified. I see. Okay. Good. Any other comments or questions? No further comments or questions. All in favor of approving board resolution 106. Signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Let the record show that passed unanimously. 107. All right. So, uh, board resolution 107 is Pike Island for Winter Motor Rail Terminal General Plumbing Contractor. At the Weirton Area Port Authority. Board resolution for the purpose of issuing a general plumbing contract for the Pike Island Pool Winter Motor Rail Terminal facility. Whereas the WAPA board recognizes that the Pike Island Pool Winter Motor Rail Terminal property closing is nearing completion and as part of job plan one, which is pre-restoration, and once job plan one is complete, general plumbing services are required. Whereas companies were sought out who provide this service, and it was determined that Rico Plumbing Services, Rico West Virginia, was best suited and willing to provide this service with this information being provided to the Executive Director. <clears throat> Therefore, let it be resolved that the Board authorize the Executive Director to negotiate a performance-based contract for general plumbing services with Rico Plumbing, Rico West Virginia. This contract shall be a limited contract covering only the general plumbing services during Job Plan 1 and Job Plan 2, 
at the Pike Island Pool and the Rail Terminal, and include strict program management controls to ensure all activities of the contract are done to meet insurance and financing requirements. And further resolve that the contractor shall acquire and hold throughout the term of the contract commercial liability, workman's compensation, and surety insurance, which shall cover the general plumbing services and the total value of the contract. And further resolve that prior to executing the contract, the executive director shall present the contract to the board for approval. Can I have a motion to bring board resolution 107 to the floor for discussion? Motion. Now, for the motion, so second. Second. Doug, second. Uh, comments, questions? Straightforward. Okay, with no comments or questions. Uh, all in favor of approving board resolution 107, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Let the record show 107 pass unanimously. 108. Board Resolution 108, uh, Pike Island Port and Motor Rail Terminal Fire Suppression Contract. The Whitman Area Port Authority Wapa Board Resolution for the purpose of issuing a fire suppression contract for the Pike Island Port and Motor Rail Terminal Facility. Whereas the Wapa Board recognizes that the Pike Island Pool property closing is nearing completion and, as a part of the closing, an updated fire suppression system in the building is necessary to meet insurance and fire requirements. Whereas companies were sought out who provide the services and it was determined that communal fire protection contractors, Columbus, Ohio, is best suited and willing to provide this service uh, with this information provided to the executive director. Therefore, let it be resolved that the board authorizes the executive director to negotiate a performance-based contract for a fire suppression system with communal fire protection contractors based in Columbus, Ohio. <clears throat> this contract shall include provisions for one, uh, field inspection of existing fire suppression system, including examination of all existing piping, hangers, and automatic sprinklers, along with an internal pipe inspection of each system. Uh, two, <coughs> approval, of the approval to remove the existing fire suppression system via a letter of certification saying the removal can proceed. And three, design of a replacement fire suppression system, which is to be in full compliance uh, of all state and local codes, NFPA 13, and U.S. Coast Guard regulations regarding waterfront facilities. Further resolved that the contractor shall acquire, hold, or shall acquire and hold throughout the term of the contract commercial liability, workman's compensation, and surety insurance, which shall cover the fire suppression assessment and the total value of the contract. And further resolved that prior to executing the contract, the executive director shall present the contract to the board for approval. Can I have a motion to bring this uh, resolution 108 to the floor? Motion. Both motion. Second. Second. Farley second. Uh, comments, questions? All right. No comments or questions. Uh, all in favor of approving resolution 108, signify by saying aye. All opposed? Let the record show 108 passed unanimously. All right. <coughs> Next agenda topic is key performance indicators. <laughs> okay, so uh, for the metrics this month, uh, we we'll start with governance, uh, monthly meetings. Uh, we've had four so far this year. Yeah, four because of the second. A total of 58. Uh, we have five resolutions approved prior to these five. Uh, so for a total of 96 um, from the beginning of uh, 2010. Uh, we have 13 written consents. We have only two rejected resolutions, three amended, and uh, five are still in committee. Uh, active committees, finance, asset operations, uh, labor, and safety, and the attendance of the meetings have been holding steady in the mid-30s. Um, we've had up to 50 in, this, in the last six months, up to 70 months, I think, we've been going for. Facebook, uh, I got a message that Facebook went through and did a cleaning, so our number changed because they removed inactive accounts. I got a note that they removed 12, so if you take 487 down 12, it's 475, split to 43, so we gained eight or nine again this month. 
on YouTube. We had 36 views of last month's meeting and 38 attended the Roberts Rules of Training uh, uh, event. I will say in the numbers, then, the numbers on the other months also all went up, especially January. Um, January and November all increased a lot. Yeah. Um, okay. And business partners. Uh, we knew this. We have uh, two two additional business partners this month: Fallsway Equipment Company of Akron and Sintus First Aid and Safety of Bridgeville. Uh, and then our volunteer uh, running total is uh, active volunteers are 16. One of them became a board member. <laughs> uh, then we have terminal training. Uh, the training uh, apps received, we didn't have any in the last couple of months. Uh, active trainees are four. Uh, FEMA certificates earned 360 total. And uh, level one, you can see down through level four, the two are level four. And we still have six white black belt certificates, two yellow plus two waiting uh, for uh, closure. And uh, no green or no black. Terminal security, uh, TWIC, TWIC credentials were up to 27. Uh, DHS uh, sensitive secure information non disclosure agreements are 44. And we have four new ones. And CT PAD access, access is 14. Criminal operations, there we go. So this past month, 736,300 pounds have been shipped. Metal processing and shipping metals out of the facility down there in our, in our uh, activities. Not clean up the process. That's just with the work going on inside the facility right now. Uh, internal work permits. That's how many tons? That's about 365 tons, about 120 a week, tons of metals, various metals being removed and taken out of the building and generally ready. Any more uh, info on that or Joe, anything else? Joe, can you attest to that? Yes, absolutely. Joe, Mr. Yeah. Duco, and with Mr. Casimir and Mr. Taylor and the rest of Gracie. The Gracie's guys are down there uh, doing help with y'all. Uh, internal work permits. We have seven new permits this month. of will close two. And uh, we have five on-site manifests, five locations with uh, manifests. BJ. Yes, sir. The aerial lift, is that a crane? The aerial lift, sir? No, the aerial lift is the big, uh, uh, what's the man lift? Articulated man lifts. Yeah, man lifts. Articulated man lifts. Yeah. And this is certified on-site, those that are on-site certified, not to run until that's why the numbers change. So this month on-site, we have had four forklift and two area with certified individuals. We have 13 consultants and five contract personnel uh, and funding applications with two applications in process. Okay. Progress update. So what I put together here are uh, what, what Marty mentioned earlier about the West Virginia Public Court Authority's statewide plan. Uh, Parsons Brinkerhoff in 2012. Uh, Parsons is an international transportation and, and, and consultant. Um, they do a lot of different work. And they did a, a study of the state in the various uh, port areas, the catchment areas, defined catchment areas. Defined, and we grabbed a couple of things from back in 2012 that I listed up here, and I'll read them real quick. Uh, and this is Parsons' expert opinion. The shipping industry needs to be educated in river shipping. Many people do not know how to get a product from New Orleans to where. Education combined with marketability could be used could be used as a foundation to make business, businesses aware and produce alternative shipping options. If fuel prices continue to escalate, shippers will want multiple options. And just for example, I mean, that's, a, that's a transportation mode we have that's operating at 30% capacity. So there's a lot of capacity. It's a, it's a high volume, low cost uh, method. And the more knowledge and understanding of that, the, the better the region commerce will be as we get off the an additional mode. Uh, next is, uh, WAPA would like to capitalize on connecting fiber optics to anchors. For example, it could track products from Mexico in real time by monitoring temperatures. If a problem arose, the system would produce an alert, and the load could be diverted and saved. Currently, shippers do not know if their product is fresh or ripe or spoiled upon arrival. This example was a discussion of food products shipping from Mexico to Philadelphia 
in refrigerated containers, and they don't know until it gets there that the refrigeration was lost in North Carolina. And so most of the shipment's bad. Or the guy receiving it says to the shipper, this is all bad, whether it is or not. So there's no way for anyone to really manage that. So with proper technology, tracking, fiber optic capabilities, and bandwidth capabilities, you take that cost out of the risk and the cost out of that system by real-time notification, divert to a refrigerated warehouse where you can get a new trailer and move forward. And you as a shipper can ensure your product gets to the site on uh, in the proper condition. That was just an example. There's vibration, there's shock, there's temperature, there's even weights now, some wave type sensors that you can use on it. WAPA has to continue to apply and receive for various uh, receive approval for various designations, regulations, etc. to be federally legitimate. Uh, we've submitted I don't know the total, if you understand the total numbers, but we've been applying and, and being approved and accepted in various uh, uh, programs from the United States Department of Transportation Office of Mobility. Uh, we qualified there with WINK um, in, area, in four areas that the state, was, no one else in the state was qualified for. So we're looking for those added leverage points. We're in CTPAC. Uh, with Homeland Security, we're part of the Coast Guard Cyber Security Subcommittee activities, etc. So we continue to do that and build our our credentials for federal uh, compliance and federal uh, designation. Uh, designation. Some of our members are on Homeland Security networks that require multiple approvals to even get there. So we have two or three of those. Yeah, special networks, special disclosures, special controls. Uh, state workers, or the last bullet was state workers, are trying to understand WAPA's strategic model. WAPA currently needs a champion at the state level to validate its strategic plan. Where do you go? I know he's sitting over in the corner oh, there. I was going to ask him, how's that going? <laughs> You're my champion. <laughs> yeah, shuffled your way with you. Uh, you can honor our delegate. Uh, and Mark has been a very good help at the state and, and locally. He's also the chairman of the development. Are they answering the phone down there, Mark? No. Thank you. I, uh, I spent the first week while I was down at the legislature, like maybe three times a day, kind of calling the port authority, and nobody answered. So we, we uh, needed to establish that, and we've got a few folks on there. Then, then I got real busy, and I didn't get a chance to even get over there, and I feel pretty bad about that because I, I intended to do it. Plenty of time. Yeah. All yeah. kind of me meetings during the year. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of them. We also met with the uh, uh, delegate or Senator Wells. Is Brian? He's a senator. He? No, he's a delegate. He's a delegate. Brian Ferns is a senator. But I met with both of those, and they have interest also. So we're building that that support group, and, the, and and we do have we have a different model. The state's learning it. It's a new model around the country, basically. Of course. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Man. A couple of uh, other areas. We've heard a lot about different audits. So what I wanted to do is define some of these audits that are occurring or have occurred. Prior to these slides, in 2012, there was a legislative audit that defined the Rear Area Port Authority based on the legislation. There's a political subdivision of the state of West Virginia. The auditor's office determined this uh, doing substantial uh, critical government work. Uh, but there was an audit gap in, in auditing the Port Authority structure within the state structure, not just within the structure. And so if we weren't, we aren't taking public funds until that audit gap is closed. That's not long. That was done in 2012, and it was completed at that time. What's going on today is a forensic audit. Uh, it's an examination, evaluation of a firm's financial information for use as evidence in court. Forensic audits can be conducted to prosecute a party for fraud, embezzlement, or other financial claims. Additionally, an audit may be conducted to determine negligence. So there's been a lot of confusion and a lot of craziness since we started in. So part of the audit structure is to validate, well, I'm, we're comfortable with our structure validated, but the, everything's going to go through that level of detail because it's an SEC, it's a federal program, there's been a variety of efforts and attempts. You heard the uh, mayoral candidate. And so part of the diligence is a forensic audit for this program. Anything else that Mike, you want to add to that? or anybody? Financial audit. Well, obviously that occurs and is occurring in finance. An examination and evaluation of firm's financial information to provide an opinion whether financial statements are stated in accordance with specific criteria, uh, normally international accounting standards, GAAP, uh, IFRS, etc. 
In providing an opinion, the auditor gathers evidence to determine whether the statements contain material errors or other misstatements. Again, we're talking about SEC rules and public uh, public law and public finance, and and so there's very tight controls on the finances of uh, trading SEC-related companies, power placements. We've been following to the highest level of federal requirements and will continue, and a financial audit what goes on to validate that. And I'm sure we've got a whole bunch of little gaps and myths that you know we, we did, didn't understand or whatever, but it's, uh, it's more of a learning tool than, a, than anything else, unless there's some major you know, material defect or resulting in those <laughs> steps. Okay, yeah. Compliance audit. It's a comprehensive review of an organization's adherence to regulatory guidelines. So it's an audit to regulations and, and rules and, and, uh, and uh, regulations related to various areas like independent accounting, security, or IT consultants can evaluate the strength and thoroughness of compliance preparation, preparations. Auditors review security policies, user access controls, risk management procedures, and other key procedures over the course of the audit. So full compliance to all your internal policies, Laws and regulations, in this case, SEC, Coast Guard, Federal, we have a variety of items there. And then another topic that we've talked about off and on or has been circling is restraint of trade. Uh, it's an, it's an, an, in antitrust law, any activity, including agreements among competitors or companies doing business with each other, which tends to limit trade, say, to limit sales or limit transportation in interstate commerce or has a substantial impact on interstate commerce. Most of these actions are really one of the various antitrust statutes. Some state laws also outlaw local restraints on competitive business activities. So any, any obstructive efforts or restraint of work or, or, or smear tactics or whatever, that would be restraint of trade in, in other contracts or other disclosures or interference. And so those are the kind of things that, that we've all experienced in all businesses, not just the people. Milan's got a variety of uh, litigation activities at all times and all companies do, but these are some key aspects for our audience and for our goal to make sure we understand as we align with the disclosures of third-party transactions, material transactions, and the uh, insider trading policies as we continue to escalate the compliance. Go ahead, MJ. This is a, a diagram today of a Section 559 alignment in Metropolitan Statistical Area. Uh, the three county areas, a uh, uh, metropolitan statistical area uh, designated by the federals uh, as an MSA crossing two economic, uh, national economic development districts. So it's a unique, unique location that's perfectly aligned for a port authority. I think your uh, your board, board uh, Dr. Brown, in yep. 2010, Dr. 11, John Brown, yeah, executive uh, director, presented to the United States Congress and, and established the the current operations under the MSA, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Dr. John Brown uh, is just retired from the uh, Brooke Hancock Jefferson Metropolitan Planning Commission. And I don't recall what year. 2010. 2010. Uh, he, he was able to work with Congress and, and, and also the Philadelphia and Chicago Economic Development Authority regions uh, and was able to get Philadelphia to extend across the Ohio to, to Steubenville and Jefferson County and Chicago into Brook and Hancock County, which essentially built the MSA, which is a three county, two state uh, overlap. It, 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 and it, it gives us special opportunities. The federal to, designation. The federal the designation, port. right. As, it, it aligns to the federal designations of federal birth So underneath the Bureau of Labor Statistics, then the Steubenville Weirton area is an MSA number 66400. You can go into their database and end up getting all kinds of information associated with that. Well, they, the, the significance of this for, for most folks is the alignment you know, over the years with the Port of New York, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Is uh, once you establish the the multi-state MSA, then that's that is the major milestone to the next step of federal designated port. So you see that with the Port of New York, New Jersey. As, as such, and it took them 30 years to get that established, of course, back from, uh, I think it was 1932 to uh, the 60s when they established the current port in New, New Jersey. Also a self-sustaining port that does not derive income through the, uh, the taxes. The same as what we're doing. It's, it's exactly, 
I, I, exactly the same, except we're in. So that, that establishment of that MSA is what you saw in the Parsons Breaker Off report that established the, the uh, catchment area of uh, centered around Weirton. MJ mentioned Steubenville Weirton, uh, since we have board members from Steubenville. Uh, the, I guess we'll do the Steubenville Weirton on the right side and Weirton Steubenville on the other side. <laughs> Uh, and this, yeah, and this diagram shows a transition of activities, but also a combination of 2012 efforts and where we are today. Uh, the public-private partnership began with WAPA establishing a not-for-profit wink, uh, a 501c4, and then a for-profit through partnerships <coughs> and investors with Wink as a partner. That's how we started. So Wink did a lot of M&A and a lot of uh, permit work and supported a lot of the local activities. Uh, TSPM was a supporter and the marine terminal portion of the pilot, of the pilot program. And at where we are today, though, is we've also now, over the, through the restructuring efforts, created Office of Executive Director, uh, and then we're, we're establishing rights of use agreements for WINK, TSPM, to, through term sheets, to transfer to, to, for uh, inland services to utilize. Uh, rights of use and controls of the things that they put in place. And inland services, along with intermodal holdings, was set up by the boards, by the Office of the Executive Director, to manage the, the uh, rail terminal, the marine terminal uh, project in the park and, and establishing job plan one. So we're using term sheets that then lead to the formal contract with the term sheets to find the basic terms of the agreements and are transitioning rights of use for that uh, intellectual property or policies. And also, we also have uh, uh, Gracie Painting Contractors was a concessionaire who, who is in the building, vendor financing, performance based today as a concessionaire, as our model requires. And as they generate revenue from their work, they all they put funds into a future fund and, and pay for their portion of the concession. But this future fund is established for the money to come back into the community. Uh, and the public benefit aspect is when the, when the linkages are, are established whenever they are, when the cities and counties qualify for the funding. Uh, those are our executed term sheets tonight. Yeah, they're all executed, all executed. signed, and completed. Uh, and also, just again, we have two uh, key tax business tax structures of these of this uh, corporate structure: IRS 6320 and the IRS 338H10. Uh, and it again overlaps; the, the, they overlap the region and support the, the MSA. I put this up last, last week. This is Inland Services, which is the key uh, company today in the group that's moving forward with a lot of the work. Uh, and just to remind everyone how it functions, Inland Services provides services, affiliate services to the customer and to the affiliates through affiliate service agreements and, and facilities and other service agreements. But also, what they can do internally, they do, but will contract for other outside requirements, supplies, services. Uh, through master services agreement. So, you know, if we need an engineering service or activity that we don't have, uh, Farley's group is engineering and, and ask for something they don't do and do a contract and, and bring that in to be able to provide services to our affiliates and our customers. Um, that's all I have for the presentation side. I don't need to make sure we sign those on this uh, signature. Um, we, we will have an executive session, but before that, you wanted that one in there? Yeah, that, that's again the three, you know, the three areas. The Whitten Area Port Authority, Board of Director, General Counsel, Master at Arms, Charter Committee, Office of Executive Director. It's an autonomous political subdivision. It's an autonomous, standalone, independent, uh, tied into the Federal Maritime Commission and other through state and federal uh, oversight, but it's an independent entity. Whitten Area Port Authority Inc. is a not-for-profit, non-profit public benefit corporation. Again, everything we do is public benefit. Public-private requires public benefit. We're using public infrastructure. We're rebuilding the public infrastructure and benefiting the public. But we're also letting, allowing private groups to do that. So there's got to be a lot of control and it benefits all parties. Uh, they have a board of directors, chairman, working groups, and their general counsel. Then, then the private affiliates. West Virginia Real Estate handles real estate related property management and other type of real estate transactions. West Virginia Port Communications is technology and communications. And Tri-State Port Management does a lot of operation type services. 
Inland Services, again, is a, is a consolidated service provider for all the groups and is, is really taking a lot of this past work forward for now. And Intermodal Holdings is a holding company, both set up by the executive director. So yeah, I, now I usually ask for questions from you guys before we go into the executive session in case you have a couple questions you want to ask. Do you have any timelines uh, uh, for the audits to be finished? Yes. Time, timelines? Completion of audit timelines? I, I think the key there, Mark, is the uh, uh, completion of the independent restraint of trade investigation. Is, is, uh, we signed the firm last Thursday, I think it was, we were in Akron. Okay. So the, the audit completion that's, that was independently set up and, and commissioned by the, the, by the board should be complete by June. Any other questions? PJ, is that the Roberts rules, are they used by a public and private? Yeah, they can be. The boards, it's up to the whatever board it is to choose to adopt Roberts rules. And you can adopt Roberts rules, Roberts rules short form. Most governments use Roberts rules of war, parliamentary rule, and some structure. So I'm most sure. Most species. Most species. I'm sure there are some that don't. I don't know. And then for the ship wages for uh, legislature. Shipping by barge on the river, but the fuel prices, when the prices today, though, is it really still true? Because you put on there, was fuel prices are escalating. Yeah, but one, one barge has, what, 700 and some truckloads. Yeah. So if you think of the fuel of the barge and the fuel of the 700 trucks, no matter what the price of fuel is, it's going to be cheaper. Again, it's a matter of time, too, sometimes, though. Sometimes if it takes too long or there's issues, they're going to pay more. But the most you want to, you know, if you, the more you can get on the water, in, at, at the highest volumes, the costs are going to be lower. Then the rails next, and the trucks are last. The trucks do the most damage to the roads, and et cetera. So they well, have additional costs. I, I think it's important to remember that that report was done in 2012. Okay, today it's a federal mandated waterway that changes significantly, which is the commissioning of the, the integrated product team today that's a, as a result of the audits and so forth and so on. So the, the security of the inland uh, waterway system is a priority one uh, for national security. So the, the uh, getting the, the scheduled services going again on the waterway is, is a mandate. You'll see us the tremendous amount of federal, I think we just were monitoring the United States Coast Guard went out and they're beefing up their boarding uh, uh, security forces. So it's, the bottom line is the federal oversight of that waterway. You're going to see a lot more activity down there in, in the uh, uh, governance of how that waterway is, is, is today. And fuel prices for security are not going to factor into it when the, the updated report from 2015 comes into it. Right. It'll all be driven by maritime domain security. A lot, a lot of the previous reports are going to be updated because the trending has been using data from right. report, 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 report. That's all. Uh, yeah, last week was uh, came where you had, I think, three barges in one day at the bank on the other side. <laughs> yeah. They got it backed off and got out. But that's a lot of data. This morning, about 5 o'clock this morning, I seen one going up river. Never seen it before. And uh, he went towards the, the high side too far. I watched him for a good while, but he finally backed off and made the turn. And Mike is, uh, I didn't introduce Mike, he's a board member of Blink, but he also works at Stavologies on the river there and he sees a lot of the yeah. activities. And it, it's a tough turn. They're there every month, backing up or getting to hit the bank. So. Bugsby, as an order of magnitude, I used to do a lot of uh, freight comparisons, but it, 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 roughly you're about uh, 10 cents per ton per mile on, by, by truck. You're in the pennies range for ton per mile by rail and your tenths of cent per ton per mile via barge. Wow. Yeah, so it's a lot of money <coughs> that the mandates cool. security and utilization, it's going to be a big opportunity. So, so you're all, already, I think you're working on an optimization, logistics optimization with Hellman to get the uh, into San Luis Potosi. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean you're gonna see a lot more oversight of course to, to reactivate Bubba from the old days when that waterway was, was fully churning. So it's, it's coming. But that scheduled service, both uh, 
both domestically and internationally, it is, uh, requires that federal oversight. Any other questions? Okay. And with that, uh, my, we have an executive session, so I need a motion to come to executive session. Dan, second. Uh, Ed Littlejohn, all in favor? Signify the same Opposed, Mayor? Crystal. I will be. regular session. Any seconds? Second. Uh, Dan Spicker seconds. Uh, all in favor of uh, returning from executive session signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> uh, we're back in the executive session. I'm going to have a motion to adjourn. Adjourned. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. aye. All right.